Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to Essentially Jacob, my perfume fragrance shrine. Today we will be reviewing an exclusive Les Eaux de Chanel, Paris Paris or Paris Paris, you guys. The background is set in the same color and hue as the liquid, as the juice in this little bottle. This perfume is launched in May of 2022. I've been testing it already. Check out how much I already used up. This thing is uh, incredible in terms of, well, we're going to get to it. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Push the um, a join button next to the subscription button if you are on my main channel. Otherwise, join me on Patreon. Super Take All spelled together for extra perks. I live stream every Saturday on my main channel. That's where I film all of these videos. So this video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I have my co-reviewers in the chats. Hello, everybody. If you got your sample or bottle of Paris Paris, now is the time to take it out and start spritzing away and sniffing away together with me. So it comes in the regular Les Zoo container, you know, that kind of feels like uh, recycled it, it's like the interior paper of their perfume boxes it's that cardboardy paper that they would put inside of their perfume boxes and then they would have another paper surrounding it so they're kind of making this sustainable move except of course we have plastic foliage surrounding it the back has this see they kind of just etched into the cardboard some text and Nothing particular of mention in the ingredients back here. There's no like pure, there's no rose essence in there, jasmine essence, nothing. It's all kind of, you know. But how does this thing smell? Well, I, of course, I've been testing it out several days, so I'm really prepared for this review. But also, um, I, I have it sprayed on this arm, so it, I have the dry down here and here, all over actually in my hair as well. And then we're going to spray away here a little fresh dose you know, just because, you know what? Just, yas. Okay. Oh. Mm. Mm. Okay, you guys. So, release day 2022, Olivier Polge is the perfumer of Paris Paris. And uh, in the top notes, so we already have really interesting simplicity here. You know, Les Eaux de Chanel is a very simplistic concept uh they have released five thus far we had paris biarritz we had paris deauville paris venice paris riviera paris edinburgh or edinburgh and now we got paris paris the sixth fragrance in the series so they're kind of on this tangent of releasing one a year now during the pandemic they kind of skipped a year so paris edinburgh was late but usually it's like one a year. They, they launched uh, the series with three, Biarritz, Deauville, and Venice. Three came out first, and then usually it's one a year or every two years. Citruses, lemon, and pink pepper in the top notes. And then we get to the heart, which is the DNA of this perfume. The Damask Rose, the Rosa Dam Damascena or Damascus Rose. And then you got patchouli in the base notes. That's it. That's kind of what Chanel is telling us about this fragrance. They do tell you you can layer it with all the other Lazoos. You can also layer it with other perfumes, with other Chanel fragrances. I tried layering it with Le Lion de Chanel already. Really interesting. But Le Lion de Chanel is so overpowering. That kind of poor Paris Paris has, has no, no, no chance. Because Les Eaux de Chanel are meant to be light fragrances. They're not meant to be so overpowering and overbearing. This one is, it's, it's just divine for spring and summer. It is so floral. I mean, the rose in this thing is in, insane. I've layered it with Chanel number no. five. Obviously, it mixes very well with Chanel number no. five because the, the May rose in Chanel number no. five with the Damask rose in Paris Paris really mixes very well. You don't get much of the citruses in the opening notes. They kind of dissipate really quickly, and then you're left with a powdery rose, this damask rose, which, when I first smelled this thing, and I can tell you, the first sniff, of course it's super citrusy, fresh, the aldehydes are sparkling in it, and then right after that, you sink into a powdery rose with, with an oily subtone of patchouli. You know, patchouli can be heavy, but not in this case. The patchouli kind of 
is blended masterfully to elevate that rose, give it a, a, a sort of an oily substance, but at the same time, the rose battles back with its powderiness. And a damask rose is a very dusty rose. So the first impressions I had with this perfume when I first sprayed it on was, I was like, oh, I know this smell. This is such an old smell. Now, I know we don't say, I mean, some people do, oh, this smells of grandma. This smells like a granny. This smells like an old person perfume. None of that. This smells of otherworldly, old in terms of, I've smelled this before. It's it's a type of rose oil that you can buy in, you know, there's there's in some cities you still have little perfume shops where you can mix it, your own perfumes and they ha they create their own little formulations. They have their own essential oils. And this is kind of a classic old school rose smell. And you might think, well, that's not groundbreaking. No, and in fact, it's not. It's, it's that simple. It's that basic. It, it's a slightly bitter, powdery rose. It's delicious. <laughs> I mean, at the beginning, I was like, hmm, it smells like a potpourri of dried up rose petals that you would put in your wardrobe, mixed with other florals and a little bit of um, patch, patchouli in there. And then it's kind of like, it smells like a dusty rose. It smells like a, a dusty old wardrobe. If you know what I mean, some people have that tendency of putting little satchels, little cotton satchels or silk satchels filled up with herbs and um, dried up flowers from the Provence. <laughs> and then you kind of put it in your wardrobe and it kind of smells. That's what this smells like. It smells of a dusty old Paris from the 20s, but with modern technology because the lightness of this fragrance would not have been made in the 20s, I, I don't believe. So calling it Paris Paris, at, at first I thought, mm, really? Is this how Paris smells like? But Paris doesn't smell like this to me. Paris usually stinks. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I mean, if you're at least in the center of Paris, all the people walking by you, they're always overly doused in perfume, which I live for. It's something that the rest of the world stopped doing. Paris is still doing it. And they still accept perfumes much more than the rest of the world does. Um, but then, you know, with this kind of first impression that I had of, oh, I've smelled this a thousand times before, nothing groundbreaking, dusty rose, old wardrobe. You know, in the beginning I thought, mm, meh. But then as I wore it and I kept testing every day, I mean, look how much already has been used up, right? As I kept using it and testing it and testing it, I realized wait a minute, there's something to this perfume. Hold on. Well, first of all, longevity. Okay, this is the first lezou for me that lasts a whole day, especially when you stick it to clothes. And I, this is a cotton shirt, for example. Um, I usually, I only wear cotton. Maybe sometimes some acrylic, something over, but on my skin, usually it's just cotton or wool. It keeps the fresh dustiness of this damask rose so perfectly intact for at least a day. Sometimes I would wake up the next morning and I would still have it on my pajama or something. I'll be like, oh, it's still there. It smells effervescently spring-like. And as I started noticing the longevity, how cleverly it's not overbearing and overpowering, but it sticks around quite long, I started realizing Oh, so this is the smell. I get it now. I'm slowly starting to get it. This is the type of smell that you feel if you're kind of going through Paris at night in some bars and you, you hook up with somebody, you go to their place, and then the next morning you got that walk of shame through the gray sky lit Paris, you're walking back home, the hair is a little bit messy, and that's the smell. This is the smell of the morning after. It's um, it's very poetic. Yes, we've, we've smelt this before, but it, it's so dreamy. It really, really, to me, it gives this, this color here, you see there's gray in there. It's like a gray sky, typical for Paris. I mean, a lot of people love blue skies, but when you're in Paris, you want to experience Paris 
under a gray sky because there's nothing more romantic than Paris under a gray sky. This is just my opinion. And this thing smells of gray skies with a little bit of leftover sex <laughs> in your system. So there's that residue of the sexy night before, and but but you're walking through the early, the dawn of the streets of Paris underneath a gray sky. Uh, the patisseries, the boulangeries, they're all kind of opening up. You have this, maybe the scent of croissants in the air as well. I mean, now we're over uh, romanticizing Paris. Paris is not that cute. I mean, the center of Paris is that cute, really. So there's a romantic, poetic vision of Paris in this little bottle. And, well, little bottle, 125 mil, not that little. They're, they haven't released the 50 mils yet. Hopefully they will release 50 mil of this one as well so we can travel with it too. They have, however, already released, I got also a sample of the body lotion. So I do believe that the shower gel or the bath gel is also out there. So this is a six mil sample. Another thing that they released, like they did with Paris Edinburgh, they released the Paris Paris fan. So it's a paper fan folded with the image of, of Paris Paris, all in aquarelle kind of. I'm not going to open this swap up because I collect these. So I just got one for now. If I get a second one, I will open it. But you, you can check out my Paris Edinburgh uh, review. I opened up one of those fans there. It's literally just a plissé folded paper. And then it has a little rubber band here. So you have to kind of really stretch it out to open it. It doesn't open like expensive fans. It's just a folded paper. It's a freebie, but it's a beautiful collectible piece so I got this as well and for the first time ever they released this gorgeous set of samples that um, encompasses the entire collection all six of the lesus look at that in one sample set isn't this amazing every and look at this and I had to laugh when I read the text we're always talking about the Hermes journeys and the Birkin and the Kelly check, check this out Every eau de Chanel is a journey. <laughs> I think the marketing team has been watching us, haven't they? So these are all of those kind of like blended photos. Uh, there's a photo of every city. Obviously, this is Venice. Uh, this might be Edinburgh. I don't know anymore. But so one of these is this kind of pastel photo of a, a natural landscape or of a city landscape. Um, and, and then that, that would be printed on this fan as well. So probably... So this is this is Riviera, I think. Um, Paris should be this one with that gray kind of type of gray sky, blue gray sky and rooftops of Paris. So this is really, really, really cool. This little set, it's a kind of a little sample set that they gave me as well with with this little baby. Now, since I got it a while ago, uh, they did not have the knitted pouches to go with it yet but i i was told that when they do get it they're gonna let me know and i'm gonna go and pick up my paris paris pouch let's spray some more so it's not that overpowering you can you can keep spraying away and it's fun and fresh it does last on the clothes not so much on the skin I, on the skin you might get four to five hours out of it mm, on the clothes it can go on for a day and it's really interesting they tell you already in the boutique layer it all of the lazoos are meant to be layered with each other. So I have layered it with Deauville, with Biarritz, with Venice, with Riviera, and with Edinburgh. I can tell you the first time I sniffed Paris Paris, I thought to myself, oh, this smells like Paris Riviera. It has that Riviera subtone in it. But Riviera is all about the Neroli in reality. And um, I have it here. So we got Paris Riviera. Also, I've used it up quite a, quite a bit, haven't I? But it is a more sunny, summery, almost like suntan lotion-y type of smell. And in fact, you can check out Paris Riviera, the review, also on, available on my um, Essentially Jacob YouTube channel. I have uh, the unboxing and first impressions of this perfume uh, and in a video. And then I also have the actual review of this video. And I reviewed this video in Paris in a hotel room in Paris. That was a funny, funny little moment. So they do have a different color, as you can see. Well, you can't really. Well, this one is more yellowy. Riviera has that peachy, beigey color. And Paris Paris is all about the rose, gray rose hues and, and, um, and pink hues. Now, Paris Paris 
is a perfume that grows on you. Don't judge it the first time you, you try it. Because this is not one of those that, you know, they say don't judge a book by its cover. It's going to smell like something you've smelled before. It's going to smell dated. It's going to have that dusty rose smell in it. It's going to be underwhelming. But when you get the poetry of it after you've worn it for a couple of days, it's that slow, moody Catherine Deneuve or Catherine Deneuve moment of her Belle de Jour. Has anybody seen Belle de Jour, the movie? Um, she's this bored bourgeoisie housewife that wants a little kink in her life. And so she decides to become a prostitute. And then she's walking through the streets of Paris, these like really bourgeoisie houses. Uh, and uh, in one of them is, is a, you know, is a bordel. So there's a little boudoir moment there. And then she gets a job in that place. And, you know, she wants rougher sex. She wants to compensate with sex, everything that she's been missing in her life. And the sex has to be rough because her life is all soft and simple and easy and comfortable, too comfortable. And this is kind of what Paris Paris is. It has that annoyed, boring simplicity, you know, like, you know, when a bourgeois, in a bourgeoisie setting where middle upper class is just bored, you know, you have everything you need. You don't know what to do on the weekend. Uh, <laughs> that's what this thing smells of. And then you find something zesty, a little fling, a little moment, a little sexuality there. And then, but then after that's done, you're back to that, oh, yeah. you know, like typical Parisian, by the way. There's nothing like a Parisian to deliver that. Blah, 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 blah. They're constantly in this, blah, 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 you know, that, that's the attitude that you get in Paris, Paris, except the rose is gorgeous. It's a beautiful rose, not a typical rose for Chanel. We have our May roses in Chanel number no. five. We love our May rose in Chanel number no. five, the fields of grass May rose. But the damask rose is an older rose. It, it is like the damask rose is like the grandmother of the May rose. It, that's how it feels like the damask rose is the wise elderly rose that teaches the May rose all the secrets about being a coquette. And there's something very coquettish about this perfume. It smells clean because, you know, roses usually do smell clean, but there's something that patchouli in there gives it a... And rose, a rose can also be indolic. Now, the indoles in a rose are not as crazy like they would be in a Yasminum Grandiflorum, in a day-blooming jasmine. Those indoles smell really poopy. A rose is also indolic, but the indoles in the rose kind of have a tendency of making it smell dusty and slightly off, as if the rose were starting to rot. And you have that in here. You have that notion of death and decay. Pardon me. Like, uh, I mean, an orgasm in uh, in French is uh, also called the little death, la petit mot, you know, like the, the small death when you, the climax is called the small death. So there's that climactic smell in here. It's a rose that has reached its zenith, and now it's kind of... It's Grizabella from Cats. If you know, you know. This is exactly... <laughs> this is Grizabella, you know, memories all alone in the moonlight. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Except not Sony's version of Cats. <laughs> Um, this is the original Broadway version of Cats from the 80s. And Grizabella is wearing this. This is a total Grizabella perfume. It is that shabby, you know, like maybe, okay, even one more, like one more button is open and you have your Birkin. <laughs> the Birkin is scratched up and beat up. You don't care. You know, your hair is loose and it's the morning after and you're walking home in, in the gray sky of Paris. Um that that's the scenario here. It's a it's slightly ratchet. It, it's a it's a rose that's been through some stuff, and it's a rose that's been around the block a couple of times, and it knows. And and it's not shy to show all of its wrinkles and all of its scars and pleasures, but also pains it has had in its life. 
So it is a very poetic perfume. I think Olivier Polge really delivered with this one. I am still on the fence about, well, which one of the Lazoos is my favorite. Deauville had its spot for a long time. It was number one for me. Paris Edinburgh with its With its, um, what's it called? Oh, now I have a blackout. With its um, reminiscence of Petrichor. That smell of Petrichor, it kind of was really, really edging in towards the top. But then Paris Venice is right underneath Deauville for me. So I'm like, yo, is Edinburgh going to take over the first spot of Deauville? But then this little thing sneaks in with its ratchet, sad, decadent, bourgeoisie depression, which I'm living for. I am living for that type of decadence. I'm living for that bohemian, bourgeoisie, dirty, Parisian flair. It's dirty. It's a dusty rose. So this one is really creeping, creeping up there to spot number one. And as I said in the beginning, I was judging it as something like, oh, yeah, I've smelled it before. Nothing new. Eh. Whatever. But then the more I wore it and the more it started telling me these stories, it started whispering in my ear like, hey, you know, there's more to me than just this nothing groundbreaking Miranda, um, the Devil Wears Prada moment, you know, florals for spring groundbreaking. There's more to this. There, There's more sadness in here. There, there's that notion of death and decay and everything. But a rose, in, in, in all honesty, if we analyze a rose and the poetry that's been written about roses, all of the the scenarios in which a rose is depicted in, in poetry, in literature, in movies, in theater, yes, there are other flowers to depict death per se, but roses, depending on which color you also gift, can also symbolize different things. Our, but there's nothing more poetic than a rose withering away and drying away and dying. There's, there's just something so beautiful about it to a point where I love to photograph drying roses. I think there's something much more beautiful in them than there is in the fresh, youthful rose. This is the drying rose. But it's a drying up rose in the early morning in Paris, which is the beginning of the day. So there's the birth of a new day. There's that hope and promise of youth and something good might happen. But you know nothing good is going to happen because you have that cloud of depression over you, you know, that bourgeoisie, bohemian depression of Paris looming and glooming over you. And, and you're fine with it. You're fine with the world just going to hell. You've been there. You've done that. And so that promise of youth, that the early morning beginning of the day promises, you, you don't believe in that. You just don't. That's why you have this dusty rose because you know you're already dusty <laughs> early in the morning. You're already done. But it's still kind of really nice to walk through that sleepy city that's just waking up and seeing all life around you and thinking to yourself, because I've been there several times, thinking to yourself, oh, you fools, if you only knew. And I have that little smirk on my face while I'm walking home thinking, oh, you people, you people. I wish you a lot of fun today, you know, and then I go, <laughs> I go about my vampire ways back to my little cave um, and I go to sleep and I sleep throughout the day while the rest of the world lives. That's Paris Paris. It's literally that simple. But that beautiful, it really, 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 it is Paris. It is that morning Paris. So do I recommend it? Well, if you're up for that sort of heft, <laughs> that bohemian bourgeoisie depression, then go for this. This is exactly that. It is a snotty, snobby, little depressed bitch. And I love it. I love every minute of it. It's giving me every 60s um, French movie out there. From Truffaut to Godard, you name it. The filmmakers of the 60s in, that worked mostly in Paris, this smells of each and every movie that they made. 
fascinating. And it's also fascinating because Virginie Via, who's the artistic director of Chanel Fashion, she doesn't have anything to do with perfumes, that's Olivier Polge, but Virginie Via is a big fan of French cinema and Hollywood cinema, but mostly French cinema of the 60s and 70s. So it's very fascinating to see the connection between this fragrance and, for example, the spring-summer um, 2020 Prêt-à-Porter collection that Virginie Via designed for Chanel. You remember, it was called The Rooftops of Paris. It was the spring-summer 2020 Prêt-à-Porter collection. Look it up. The whole setting was they built up these fake rooftops, all gray, Parisian rooftops. The models were catwalk, walk-in. The runway was around the rooftops of Paris. And the backdrop was a gray sky. The classic gray Parisian sky. That fashion show is literally this perfume. And so Virginie Via has that poetic vision of Chanel connected to the 60s and 70s. By the way, Coco Chanel was still alive in the 60s, so she also made a lot of the clothes that a lot of the stars and actresses were wearing in those movies, in the French movies in the 60s. And now Olivier Polge delivers in 2022, just two years after Virginie Viard's Rooftops of Paris collection, his own version of the Rooftops of Paris collection with the gray sky in the backdrop. It's fascinating. Fascinating. Oh, man. Oh, the sad... This thing is so depressing. I You just... Mm -mm. But in the best of ways, it, it just makes you linger, it makes you linger and think lazy, moody, sophisticated Parisian afternoon after I've had my walk of shame. That's Paris Paris. I hope you've enjoyed this review, guys. Let me know in the comment section down below if you have this one. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, have you given it that much thought? You know, I'm obsessed with perfume, so obviously I'm going to I'm going to go on, on, on a journey. <laughs> Every perfume is a journey. I mean, what does Chanel tell us? Every eau de Chanel is a journey. Check it out. And they also say it in French on the top. But uh, choc, choc eau de Chanel est un voyage. I, I mean, I obviously butchered the pronunciation. But yes, this was a journey, you guys. This was a, I, I know that they're referencing journeys because they're connecting pivotal cities that Coco Chanel and the brand Chanel are connected to. So obviously Chanel started in, in Biarritz and Deauville, her fashion shows, millinery, her hat business, but then also the fashion business, the French Riviera. She would also spend a lot of time at the French Riviera. That's why we have French Riviera, uh, Paris Riviera. And then of course we have Paris Venice. She discovered the whole Byzantine flair and style uh, in, in Venice. So obviously we have that connection. She was often in Venice, especially after Boy Capel passed away. And then of course we have Paris Edinburgh and Edinburgh is also one of her, you know, we know all the flings she had <laughs> over there. So we know that connection. And also we know Scottish Tweed. We know in general Tweed. We know uh, Kashmir. Um, we also know all of the a connection to, well, the 255 bag in reality is also kind of connected to uh, Great Britain in general because of uh, the satchels that the jockeys and post people used to wear. They used to do that in France as well, but this was more connected to the horse riding uh, gear that she was so used to seeing in Great Britain. So you guys, thank you so much for uh, staying uh, with me throughout this review. That This was Paris Riviera. No. Paris, Paris. This was, <laughs> I'm like, what am I talking about? It's Paris, Paris. Les Zoo de Chanel. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to my channel. Thumb up this video if you haven't already. If you've enjoyed it, thumb it up. And I shall see you all in my next one. Take care. Never give up on love.